and uh, uh, Justin and I went at uh, Wired Magazine as the uh, Unix Sherpa, uh, which was a weird thing to have in the colophon, and then it became the uh, chief engineer behind Hotwired, and Justin was one of the, the crew of us trying to figure out how to bring the web to the world and what was the right way to do it. Uh, we actually implemented a digital cache system to sell articles on, um, uh, one of David Chom's DigiCache implementations, um, uh, and actually sold an article that, ironically enough, was on the history of Xanadu. Uh, uh, just, uh, again, like a lot of interesting backstory behind that. Uh, and then a few months later, we decided to launch Hotwired as the first ad-supported website, and so I'm very sorry for that. Uh, I've been trying to atone for it ever since. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about what Hyperledger is doing, but wanted to leave you with some big ideas. Uh, uh, and uh, rather than throw up slides and, and give a long presentation, I thought uh, I'd just try to make it short and sweet, and, and we can get into questions and conversation in the panel. Um, but first, let me tell you a bit about what we're building. So Hyperledger is a part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, the Linux Foundation, been around for about 15 years, has helped be a, a bridge between the open source community that builds the Linux kernel, uh, Linus Torvalds himself, the uh, uh, original bene benevolent dictator for life, uh, actually is an employee of the Linux Foundation, um, uh, but it also has served as a bridge between that world of the developers building that code and the corporations who are building commercial products and services and the entire ecosystem around Linux. Uh, over time, uh, uh, the foundation has expanded beyond the Linux operating system into places like software-defined networking with open daylight uh, uh, or uh, cloud, and cloud technologies like with Cloud Foundry and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And about a year ago, a whole set of companies, including some of the ones in this room, I think I saw Alex Fowler here uh, uh, from uh, Blockstream. Oh, yep, hi, Alex. Um, uh, and uh, so Blockstream, uh, Digital Asset, R3, uh, companies that have long uh, traditions in open source software, such as IBM and Intel, uh, as well as banks like JP Morgan, started to ping the Linux Foundation and said, hey, that thing that you did with that operating system, could you do something like that for the blockchain? And and the project really got kicked off out of a recognition that there were probably a lot of uh, applications for this underlying data structure underneath the major cryptocurrencies, right? Uh, this idea of a linked list of cryptographically signed uh, 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 entries in a, in a shared ledger that uh, is a common shared ledger between a bunch of, of different organizations who all might be enemies of each other, like they talked about it at the last session, um, uh, but would yet still can come to an agreement on a common version of the truth. Truth, all right, which is really essential, a really hard thing to do right. And then secondly, is there room for smart contracts on top of that? Now, one application of a system like that is a cryptocurrency. All right? uh, and I have to admit, I, along with many people, missed the boat on uh, Bitcoin uh, on the original uh, Nakamoto paper when that came out in 2008, uh, when you could have been mining a few BTC uh, a day on your, on your laptop. Right? Um, but uh, I think for a lot of us, uh, there is that sense of, you know, I, I, you know, is this just about making money fast and, and you know, Know, currency speculation and that sort of thing. We know that's not true now. In fact, the reason we're talking about blockchains at all is due to the success of the Bitcoin community, of the Ethereum community, and more. And what they've demonstrated is this underlying uh, technology, uh, 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 blockchain technologies and smart contracts and that sort of thing can scale for some value of scale, can go in some interesting directions. But is it the last word? Is it all about currencies? Is it all about big public anonymous chains? Um, and I think there's a recognition that there's... Uh, actually a spectrum out there a spectrum of, uh, uh, of how you might actually build and deploy these networks in that there really doesn't need to be just one thing as the blockchain. The way there is the internet or the web, but we don't refer to the Amazon, right? Or we, don't re we might say the Twitter, but Twitter isn't the last word when it comes to how we do messaging in, the, uh, in this world. And, and, and so the, the conversation that we've been hosting at Hyperledger, and that conversation has been in the form of building code, right? Uh, building projects, building open source projects uh, uh, that have uh, are about implementing different different directions, different approaches to doing shared ledgers and smart contracts and that sort of thing. But the question is really, what is the shape of this technology? We're kind of at a moment now of a Cambrian explosion of different ideas about how to build these things. Um, the concept of consensus algorithms, consensus mechanisms, goes back 30, 40 years uh, to, uh, well, the first perhaps inflection point of that was the Paxos paper in the 1980s. Uh, but it was almost forgotten about, uh, uh, largely because 
we bought into kind of the Oracle vision of one big database and inside of one company that can scale up infinitely, right? Uh, and, and what Nakamoto did was encourage us to think, you know, not just about proof of work, which is a really big deal, um, but also about the idea of blockchains as being a way for rivalrous entities to come to convergence on a common version of the truth. And so um, uh, at Hyperledger, we have a number of different projects. Uh, Fabric, for example, uh, which is a, uh, an engine for uh, building shared consortium chains between, uh, uh, if, if your use case is you know, uh, building a, a wire uh, protocol network for uh, the banks, right, uh, uh, to have to be able to replace a trusted third party at the center. Um, there's another project called uh, Sawtooth Lake, which uh, was originally contributed by Intel, and this is, uh, uses uh, an actually uh, a really interesting feature of Intel's uh, secure extensions to their most recent family of CPUs, called, uh, and it implements a protocol, a consensus protocol because of that, called proof of elapsed time, which in some ways is like proof of work, but without the power consumption. Um, kind of an interesting approach. To another one called Aroha, which uh, comes from our, our Japanese uh, members, uh, and, and is now a full-fledged project within Hyperledger. Uh, that builds uh, a completely different approach to, to forging consensus in a permission chain. But what these projects are hopefully illustrating is that there isn't this dichotomy between you know, a small permission network and the Bitcoin network, right? That there actually is a range of uh, a spectrum of models, of governance models out there uh, with something like proof of elapsed time allowing for, for you to bring on new members uh, in that node, in that network, uh, forging consensus uh, permission than you might have in something like the banking network. Um, and it's conceivable that there are other technologies that get started or come into Hyperledger at some point that go all the way to the unpermission network side, because there's a lot of interesting things going on there. But I think we, live in, we, we will live in this world where we'll have several major public chains, you know, typically cryptocurrency driven, probably proof of work driven, because that's really the best way we know how to run big public anonymous chains at this point. We'll see about proof of stake, whether that works. Uh, but we'll have millions of private chains, millions and millions of private chains. And uh, it will has, have essentially one for every, uh, every marketplace, every, every place where you've got a number of peers who want to be able to exchange data and come to an agreement on a governance model for the exchange of that data and have a, a, a clear, consistent version of the truth in that exchange of data. But that isn't necessarily uh, the, end of the end, end of the story, right? Um, uh, the, the second... Uh, uh, I, I, I'd really like to get out is this notion that for all of these chains out there, we're really going to make uh, uh, the most progress against it uh, when we have common software underneath these chains, right? Like many of the websites you go and visit, uh, in fact, about half of all, uh, uh, still half about uh, of all modern websites, all, all active websites out there still run the Apache web server. Now, it's a very tiny component. There's a whole lot of software typically behind an Apache web server on a typical website in all sorts of different languages, all sorts of different development paradigms, but that little sliver of software that sits right at the edge of the, of the network on the server side, in about half of the cases, is software that's a derivative of what we built at the Apache Software Foundation uh, starting 21-ish 20, years ago. Um, uh, and, and that common software makes it really easy for us to, us, you know, to treat that as infrastructure and progress beyond that. Uh, and to have, uh, maybe the big idea here for us to play with is this idea that conversations about the right governance model uh, whether that's for a big public cryptocurrency, right? You know, what, it, what is the appropriate block size? Uh, what's the appropriate way to evolve that, that the, the governance in that organization? Whether there should be a mutable chain, whether something like, you know, a rollback or, or, or fund, refunding people who invested in something like the DAO in the future, you know, that is a governance question. And that's a governance question around the currency and around the operation of that platform. And maybe what we can do is look at separating that from the governance around the development of the software. Right, to the point where these questions about what is your consensus mechanism, what is your smart contract engine, uh, are, these are all just uh, parameters at the time that you mine the very first block, the genesis block on that chain, and go from there. Right? Um, and and I, think, I think that's what we're really trying to do at Hyperledger, is say, can we have a conversation about the building of this code, um, whether as a stack of technology or little components that all uh, weave together? How do we get different so software developers who have radically different how governance that's it. That's the big story. So thank you. Thank you, Brian.
So you may notice that Brian just gave a shorter than normal talk with no slides. He generously yielded his time to the upcoming panel so that there can be a little bit more interactivity. And Brian touched on issues of governance. Again, these are coming up. How are people going to make decisions? And then if this stuff, if all these experiments blossom and all these people, this Cambrian explosion of digital currencies and people build all these, it will affect our grandparents, our parents, our siblings who may not be so, you know, front row seat at the revolution like us. They will be, large institutions will be the people that touch our, our, our family's lives with this technology. And our next speaker is a software engineer, Sachiko Yoshihama, is based in Tokyo, and she has a long history of researching info, information security and also smart cities research team at IBM Tokyo. So we're very excited to hear her remarks on these subjects. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, so my name is Sashiko Shima. I'm leading a blockchain research team in Tokyo. And today I'm going to talk about our blockchain POC uh, with Japan Exchange Group. Uh, next slide, please. So just, how can I flip the slide? <laughs> just you. Okay, so the Japan Exchange Group is uh, uh, one of the large, uh, largest stock exchanges in the world, which is combining Tokyo Stock Exchange and Osaka Stock Exchange. It's about one third of the size of the New York Stock Exchange. And they uh, announced, together with IBM, this, this February, that they are going to start a POC on blockchain uh, to uh, evaluate blockchain's technical possibility and limitation in transformation of the post-trading processes. And we have done the POC in about four months, and uh, finally uh, they have published their uh, result and observation in a working paper, both in Japanese and English, which is available on the web. So today I'm going to talk through their uh, validation uh, project uh, in a viewpoint of the JPX, but of course I'm from IBM and I'm not going to talk on behalf of JPX, that's a subtle point. So the, uh, here is the use case. So this is a post-trading process of the financial market. So uh, there are uh, banks on which the investors have an account. And the banks uh, issue the, um, uh, the orders, the buy orders and the sell orders on behalf of the investors to the stock exchange. And in the stock exchange, these buy orders and uh, sell orders are matched. Uh, and, when, and when conditions match, the uh, trade is executed and go to the post-trade processes. And uh, in the post-trade processes, the clearing organization or central counterparty does netting uh, to netting of the uh, uh, trade. So that, for example, when there are uh, 8 million uh, sell order uh, from the bank to A, and when there are 10 million uh, sell order from uh, bank B to A, the only two, uh, the, uh, the difference of 2 billion, million will be actually moved so that it can reduce the actual amount of money and securities to be uh, settled. Uh, to increase the efficiency of the settlement. And uh, there is an, uh, 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 an organization called Cent Central Securities Depository, or CSD, who manages the, uh, uh, the, the depository of the, all the securities. Uh, in other words, it's a kind of master database of the securities and record how many securities that each investor has. And then uh, there is an uh, interbank payment network. And the settlement is done between this uh, CSD and the interpayment network. Um, and the CSD uh, makes the settlement of the securities by updating their database and changing the ownership of the some securities from the uh, seller to the buyer. On the other hand, on the, other hand the uh, interbank payment network makes the settlement of fund or cash by sending the money from the uh, buyers uh, bank to the seller's bank. So this is today's process, and it is a very uh, cumbersome process, uh, which costs about 40 billion US dollars worldwide, annually. And uh, in this POC, there are you know, different design choices, uh, whether you know, who will be the users of the uh, blockchain network or who will own the nodes of the blockchain network. But this is uh, the, the kind of the design we uh, finally agreed on. So in this uh, POC, the each bank has a blockchain node and also the uh, administrator, which is the role of exchange and the CCP and CSD will own another node. And then uh, investors will, will uh, be a kind of entities uh, that are 
still under the, each bank. And the banks will uh, issue the, uh, you know, this uh, trade information uh, on behalf of the investors. And uh, most importantly, this uh, central securities depositories master database uh, was moved into the blockchain and managed as a distributed ledger. And all the securities and the settlement, I, I, sorry, all the, <laughs> the uh, clearing and settlement will be done inside the blockchain using the um, smart contract mechanism. And uh, we have gone through the, uh, you know, all the use cases of this scenario, uh, from security insurance, security depository management, and trade and reconciliation, and security settlement, and fund settlement, and corporate actions, such as uh, paying uh, the dividend and, or stock spread, and so on. And here uh, is a requirement. Um, so the... Uh, the JPEX initial requirement is that they want to have a permission to network because they think that it's very important for the stability of the financial market that participants to the blockchain network member of the kind of consortium. And uh, it's needed in order to protect investors and to operate the, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure from, from the uh, in regulated, regulatory point of view. And also, they think that smart contract is an important capability to be part of the blockchain because they, ha they wanted to automate a lot of the processes such as clearing and settlement and corporate actions using the smart uh, contract. And the security pr and privacy is another process because they want to uh, limit participants to the limited organizations or financial institutions. They want to have a strong membership control. Uh, and also, there uh, is a strong uh, requirement about data privacy. For example, when the company or bank A and bank B are trading, that information should be protected from the bank B. Uh, and uh, each investor's uh, information should be protected by each bank so that bank B cannot see the investor's information in bank uh, A, and so on. And another uh, requirement was auditability. So the, uh, as an administrative uh, role, uh, the uh, JPX wanted to have an ability to audit every transaction so that they can detect illegal transactions uh, when it's happening. And performance is another issue, or another requirement. That, uh, and, but uh, in this case, uh, the latency doesn't really matter because the post-trading process is not really processed in real time, but rather uh, kind of done in a batch process usually. So, but the throughput is still a problem. So typically, in a major uh, exchange, uh, it requires about a few thousands transactions per second to uh, tens of few, uh, a few tens of uh, thousands of transactions per second. So the, uh, this is an initial uh, assessment of the blockchain applicability in the post-trade processes. So the trade and reconciliation is a difficult part because in the trading part, usually you have to match a lot of the selling order and buying order in uh, milliseconds. Uh, you know. <laughs> a lot of like high-speed trading, uh, but the blockchain is naturally a not very good choice to do such kind of the process. But uh, maybe trading and trading can be done if this trading is a slow over-the-counter type of the trading. And clearing and settlement is uh, definitely the key, uh, you know, part of this use case. And they think that it's very applicable because no high-speed process is required. And the security is depository. Uh, uh, having a blockchain as a security depository is a, also an, uh, another uh, thing that uh, they think it's applicable to use a blockchain. And especially because in the blockchain, uh, there are you know, information, uh, hi the history of the, all the transactions stored so that they can refer to the, the state of the uh, account balance at uh, you know, each point in time past. And uh, uh, corporate actions is also uh, you know, something applicable. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the clearing and the settlement. So, uh, by the way, we have uh, implemented uh, quota this year, and uh, we have uh, successfully implemented uh, all the use cases. And uh, especially in the clearing and the settlement, uh, uh, we could, uh, clearly uh, successfully implemented uh, this uh, clearing netting process and the settlement process using Hyperledger because it has a rich uh, smart contract capability supporting Turing complete programming languages. So the, um, 
And the another uh, uh, aspect that they think is important is the uh, securities, sorry, settlement finality. So, which means that uh, uh, when the settlement is met, it's not, in, uh, it's not, uh, you know, rejectable and it's unconditional. That's a very important capability that uh, for the stability of the financial uh, infrastructure. So they, they think that the uh, proof of work type of the uh, consensus was not appropriate for the financial institution because uh, in proof of work, it is also, uh, folk is possible so that some transactions which sought to be uh, you know, approved may be rejected later. And in hyperledger, we have another consensus model called PBFT, which is uh, more robust to this kind of the folk. So that, uh, the logic is that there is no fog uh, happening in Hyperledger as long as using a PBFT. And the, the delivery versus payment uh, was the uh, concept that uh, the settlement of the security is made only when the settlement of fund is made and vice versa. So that both the settlement of the securities and money is synchronized. And that kind of the capability is also uh, implemented on Hyperledger. But uh, there are some questions remain. Uh, you know, how we want to um, transfer the money uh, versus the securities. So the securities are managed as a, on the top of the distributed ledger, so it's very easy to transfer its ownership. But uh, in this case, we haven't uh, managed, we have, haven't used any digital currency uh, or something like that. So there are some uh, synchronous uh, things. So the, uh, in this use case, uh, we have assumed that, that there is a, still the uh, interbank payment network who makes the fund settlement. And uh, we kind of synchronize this uh, settlement completion in the interbank bank payment network. Uh, and then waiting for the, this uh, completion uh, to trigger the real uh, you know, completion of the security settlement. And uh, six, smart contract uh, kind of intermediate this process and worked as an escrow account. And the other choices will be to use kind of money tokens with, uh, associated with uh, uh, fiat uh, currency like Japanese yen, and then use these money tokens to, to make the settlement, or the digital currencies like uh, bitcoins. So the, uh, there are still you know, different options that we can investigate in the future. So. And the security and privacy uh, is another uh, important aspect. So the, uh, you know, the blockchain is a very good technology to protect the integrity naturally, but I think it's, uh, you know, naturally to protect the privacy because all the information is shared uh, across the uh, participants, or participating nodes. And in Hyperledger, uh, we have implemented this uh, uh, mechanism for protecting the privacy of the uh, trade uh, by using the basic security capability of the Hyperledger. So first of all, the membership uh, is controlled by the membership service, which is essentially the certificate authority of the PKI with some uh, you know, attribute certificate and so on. And then uh, we have implemented fine-grained application level access control at uh, the smart contract level using this attribute. And uh, uh, Hyperledger also protects the privacy of the transactions, uh, or, or, you know, uh, like by uh, encrypting the transaction or encrypting the stored data so that the uh, uh, overall, these uh, all the requirements are satisfied. And availability, uh, you know, one of their strong motivation to use blockchain uh, for the post-trade system is that the blockchain can potentially achieve higher availability than, uh, you know, uh, with less cost than the, uh, today's infrastructure. So they are very interested in the uh, availability. And uh, in case of blockchain, there are redundancy because there are many nodes. If some nodes are uh, even down, the rest of the node can keep working to their job. And uh, uh, it is also true for the proof of work, and in PBFT, uh, uh, up to one third of, of node can be in failure or down, uh, and then the rest of the node can continue the process the request, which was a very good uh, capability uh, for blockchain. Um, 
And so the uh, and also because the node can be distributed, it can provide a natural you know backup for disaster or some kind of things. But uh, still, in the current version of the Hyperledger, uh, there is a single point of failure, which is a membership service. Uh, but uh, this uh, architecture will be changed in the next version, I think. And uh, cost. So <laughs> we also uh, estimate the cost of the cost impact to the each layer. And application development may not change uh, in case of the blockchain uh, compared to the today's application development. But other costs like hardware cost, software cost, uh, will be reduced. Uh, and also the maintenance cost can be reduced because uh, you know because of the uh, natural high availability. Uh, there are challenges uh, such as, uh, you know, there is no good way to uh, process a time-triggered event at this moment, and there are still the gap in the performance expectations. Uh, you know, we are still far away from the uh, tens of thousands of the transactions per second. And uh, uh, also, the, in case of non-proof-of-work type of the network, what is the incentive for the participating node to operate a node is a kind of the, you know, unsolved question yet. Okay, so the <laughs> overall, uh, the conclusion is that uh, they think that the uh, blockchain has a, a possibility or potential to, you know, transform the financial market uh, infrastructure uh, because of the, you know, capabilities that we discussed. Issues remain, but uh, we think that uh, those uh, issues are not something that we cannot re resolve. It, sh it should be, we should be able to resolve those issues in the near future. That's the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sachiko. So, you're not going anywhere. Some nice people are going to bring up three chairs uh, if they're not too jet lagged. And I'm going to introduce the moderator of this panel. It's going to be Brian and Sachiko, chief of Let's Talk Bitcoin. This is somebody who saw that there needed to be a conversation happening about these things, built an online community, and then wired up that online community so that as you participate in making and watching and participating in shows and podcasts and articles, you're actually earning tokens and uh, sort of, you know, distributed currency objects that you can then use to participate in the community at Let's Talk Bitcoin. So Adam's not only a sort of observer and a provocateur in the space, but a builder and entrepreneur. So we're very excited that he'll be moderating this panel with uh, our last two speakers. Let's have some clapping. So it feels Come like on, we're, we're launching. Thank you. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. We have three on the panel. One more introduction. One more. Oh, oh and, more. and let's let's also <laughs> note that we have our fine guest Matsuo-san returning. So we're ready to go now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. How's everybody doing today? All right. So I'm moderating two panels today. This one is called "Who Owns Blockchains: Public, Private, and Standardization." Um, we've got some great guests up here who can talk to us about this issue. Um, specifically, the last talk, you know, the talk that you just gave, uh, that was a really interesting explanation of what I would call kind of an optimization of the existing way that we do things. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of stuff that um, you see on kind of the, the permissionless blockchain side is really what more of what I call innovation, where things that were previously impossible can now be done, whether they're efficient or not. Um, does, is that a good distinction between public and private, or if that's not, what, what's the difference, at least to you, between a public and a private blockchain as far as functionality is concerned? Yeah, I, I think it's a very you know, good distinction. So this is, uh, you know, uh, many POCs currently, uh, the companies are doing, are uh, driven by the existing financial is institutions to transform their financial infrastructure using new technology. So that it's, you know, not kind of completely disruptive. Right. It's kind of middle, I think. Right. So, so when I kind of look at that sort of system, I think about it in terms of casinos. A casino issues a type of token, and they might use it now in a non-cryptographic way, but they could achieve efficiencies and cross-compatibility between their network if there was a casino token that everybody sort of participated in. It seems very analogous to this system, and it seems like there are a lot of systems out there that are kind of analogous to this, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you take the source of trust that used to be all these companies, and you put it into the blockchain that lives in the sky, and then everybody just pays attention to that as their source of truth, and you basically can figure everything else out from there. The rest of the system sort of just works. All you're doing is taking out that one component and then optimizing for everything else. 
Is that right? Mm, yeah. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, do you have any use cases that uh, you or your company find interesting on a public blockchain at this point? Yeah, that's a very good question because you know we as a from, because I am from IBM, you know, working for many enterprises. I'm primarily focusing on the private network, networks, private blockchains. So you're primarily focused. Do you know if there's any? Okay, so that's fine. We can yeah, move on. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, uh, gentlemen. Um, starting with you, I'd like to kind of talk about um, what are some of the interesting use cases that you see on either side oh, on public or private. Public. public? Yeah. Okay, so. so. This is a, so uh, some kind of FAQ. So many persons are uh, so asking me to uh, so ask me also. So what is the so good so use case of the public blockchain? Uh, my my usual answer is uh, so I don't know at this time. But uh, so future future guys find the new use cases like uh, like the development of the internet technology. So uh, my so usual answer is uh, so we couldn't find uh, so some kind of good use case like uh, Uber or Airbnb at the time of so 19, uh, 1995 or six, mm. I think that the current uh, at the, this time is the same as the 1995 or six of the internet technology. So you see this really as like uh, if to use the internet analogy. You know, this is yeah. the pages but, that have all of the you know yeah. gifs on it. But so from my from my perspective, the, so uh, I think that the, the public blockchain is so effective to the data, the open data. Which so the, the value of that data changes according to time. For example, so a good example is uh, so so you know that so in Japan there is a huge accident in at so Fukushima Daiichi so power plant, and uh, okay so many persons uh, now so. Uh, uh, figuring out uh, so how the radiation, radiation data is each, at each surface, and such kind of that, so radiation data should be the open data, and this this uh, data is uh, changes according to the time. So, recording such kind of open data is uh, so good so, uh, use cases, like example of so we, where the so, uh, public blockchain technology is effective. Mm -hmm. Um, anything specific in, in the public data, any particular use cases or places where one of the things I've been thinking about recently is that if you had, people talk a lot about using um, blockchains for elections and for voting and yeah. things like that. And it feels like there are a lot of problems with that and I've seen a lot of attempts I don't like, but one thing that does kind of make sense is the idea that you could take, you know, a, a district or whatever where you're counting all of the votes and you just simply certify those results to the blockchain, and then this gives everybody the uh, tamper evidentness so that if something is wrong, you can clearly see there's something wrong with this block, but at the same time, it doesn't expose anyone's votes, and it can even be done in a distributed fashion where each, you know, place does it themselves without having to go through a kind of centralized mechanism. So, I mean, like, that's kind of what comes to my mind. Is that what you're thinking about, too, or do you have other ideas in mind? Uh, Sorry. I, it, it, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, I certainly add that that's, that is a smart uh, application of public blockchains. You could also use it for the voter registration step ahead of time, where, uh, you know, figuring out where my polling place is, but also am I actually physically registered and associated with that polling place, that sort of thing could also sure. be a really big, uh, valuable application of it. But at the, at the tail end of the summing, summing it up, that only works if that's the system of record, right? It only works if that's the same thing that the authorities are using to also figure out who won this district, who won this state, and, and ultimately who won the election. Right. right. So should something like that be on a public or a private blockchain then? Should the government run the blockchains and each state runs their own nodes? And I mean, like, is that how we should do it? So, so that's going to be an open question, right? And I think that's why there will always be multiple public chains, because there will be different governance models between them. Um, here, I, I, think, I think actually we might want to get away from the public-private distinction, or at least that using that as the exclusive frame, because permissioned and unpermissioned is a useful fr frame as well. Um, think about the DNS system, right? DNS today uh, is a system where you have a known number of entities, the registrars, who publish this data, right? And they publish it publicly. There's no gate, gate, gating factor, you don't have to pay extra for, you know, access to the DNS or anything like that. But there's only certain entities that can write into that chain. And we have a governance model for that, you know, for contesting when somebody owns a domain name that's actually my trademark, right? Uh, or, I, 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 you know, and this, is, this is something that I think we've collectively agreed to as an internet community is the right way to balance kind of the sense of identity and the sense of uh, trademark protection with, you know, the, the, you know, people who register a domain name first probably should have some priority to it, that sort of thing. 
thing, right? It's a balancing act. Um, if we were to move the DNS entirely to a blockchain-based, uh, unpermissioned blockchain-based system, it likely would turn out that simply, you know, the first to register would always win, right? It's unlikely we'd come up with something where there was a, a, a more sophisticated governance model. So we could turn the DNS system into a permissioned blockchain that was still public, right? We could turn the certificate authority system into that as well, and that actually might prevent some of the man-in-the-middle attacks that we have from TLS. So the distinction that we're talking about here, <clears throat> if we're talking about permissioned versus non-permissioned instead of private versus public, is not about transparency. It's not about the ability to see what's going into the record. It's the ability to actually append into the record, to add new information to the record. And with something like Bitcoin, anybody can do that. You just pay the fee. Whereas with this, it actually has something to do with your identity in addition to being able to follow the other rules of the system. Is that right? And there's two tiers to it, too. I mean, there's the t it's being able to participate in the consensus mechanism, right? Which, you know, depending upon the policies of those nodes and the policies of that network, could still be open to the entire public to be able to write entries into that system if you follow kind of the, the, the rules that are set by agree agreement by those nodes that are participating in that, in that mechanism. So an example might be if we do a blockchain for the healthcare industry, right? Um, it'll probably make sense not to store a lot of confidential information in the chain itself, like strictly in the, in the core chain, but in, instead store a lot of pointers. Mm -hmm. But there's still ultimately going to be some data that we store encrypted in some way in that chain. And a, and a perfectly suitable architectural design may say that the most secure data is the one that doesn't get transmitted, right? So what if the nodes in that network were bound by HIPAA, for example, or bound by a HIPAA class you know, uh, type of entities where there are these other laws about the sharing of private medical data that still apply even if the encryption breaks down, even if, the, um, even if there's a bug and somebody accidentally writes an unencrypted entry into that chain, there's still a process by which you might go back and, and wipe that out or make sure no one fair use to be able to share with an advertising network or something. So a lot of time I kind of come at this um, not from the financial perspective but from the regulatory arbitrage perspective. And basically the idea being that a public blockchain is something that's a little bit unique in that it's something that everybody can use but that nobody is inherently responsible for. And so legally, you know, again, if you have the ability to follow the law, then you are required to follow the law. But lacking the ability to follow the law, the requirement gets a little bit shakier. So how important is that? How important is uh, kind of the not just permissionless nature of the ability to append, but of the fact that even if you're a company that's using the Bitcoin blockchain, you don't have responsibility for what everybody else is doing with it and it's not your fault. Does that matter? Does that push people towards private blockchains at all? Mm. So I think that in case of Bitcoin, all the value is kind of confined in this Bitcoin network. First of all, coin will be uh, you know generated when the block is added, right? Mining is succeeded, and all the value exchanged is in, inside the blockchain network. So it, that makes it simple, and it allows the public, you know, public uh, participants to you know exchange the, the the coins on top of this blockchain network. But in many other use cases, there are some interactions in the real world, like in case of the financial market, there are uh, points that the way we want to connect blockchain into the real financial securities, right? So in that case, we, I, I, I'm not quite sure how this public network... It doesn't seem like there's much applicability there. One of the other things about the system that you described uh, was that you're actually taking the securities mm -hmm. and you're making those elements on your private blockchain or on the private, uh, mm -hmm. private ledger here as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, um, specific use mm -hmm. of the blockchain for that very particular thing. Mm -hmm. That's a system that it seems like would reach kind of a static point where it becomes, uh, you know, where it achieves the size that the participants need, and then there's really no other incentive for it to grow or to do anything else with it. It actually makes more sense, unless you want strict intercompatibility, mm -hmm. to launch a different system that would interface with these different people in this different way. Is that kind of the granularity, or, or is it like, do you see your platform eventually becoming the bank transfer platform that perhaps more than just the Japanese system uses? Mm. There's this. Uh, sorry. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this got quasi totalitarian view in that perspective, which is to say that there should only be one network ever, right? Uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the reality is that the world is much more compli complex than that. And there's reasonable disagreements between how nations may want to regulate their industries. And that, you know, it, uh, for some value of uh, a nation representing the interests of its citizens, right, is something we kind of work on and agree to, right? There's nothing about technology, whether it's a blockchain or the internet in general that 
allows for this escape pod from the systems of the world, right? Uh, uh, we live in a broader consensus mechanism called, you know, how the world works, right? Uh, it does give us freedoms and flexibilities uh, and efficiencies that might not have come before. But I, I, I think I think we got to abandon this notion that there is only one blockchain, or that it should, you know, that the metaphor is TCP/IP, right? Like it makes sense that yeah. there's only one kind of TCP/IP that we use to communicate because it's actually physically hard to use two at the same time. It's not physically hard to use two blockchains at the same time. It's not. These are two different data, distributed databases. We can talk at the same time and broker and share information across them and share even transactions between them. Right, but that all requires kind of server level automation that that enables the blockchains to talk to each other. Blockchains don't, at least yet, inherently talk to each other. But these are servers anyway. So, like, you know, coming up with common standards for how like identity should work, right, across n number of different blockchains, is pretty pretty straightforward. Sure. So, you know, on the internet, intranet thing, um, that's kind of often what is described when we're talking about private blockchains yeah, versus yeah. public blockchains. Uh, is you know, and so so uh, you're you're shaking I'm your shaking head. My, you're so, sorry, so correct yeah. me, correct me. I mean, tell no, me so, tell so, where so, I'm wrong. Okay, so the metaphor of, yeah. of you know that that private blockchains are a gateway drug to uh, to public blockchains uh -huh. or something like that ignores the roles that uh, uh, private networks have played in say bringing the internet into the home. Right. The fact is, when you have an internet uh, uh, connection into the house and you have multiple devices there, usually those are on a private network, right? And that's actually good for a number of things, not just for security. Arguably, it makes it easier for somebody from the outside to attack those devices, unless you have a, a webcam that exposes a public uh, address and now you're part of the Mirai botnet, right? Um, but it also was really good because it meant that your internet provider couldn't suddenly rate the amount that they charged you based on how many devices you could connect, right? What happened on the other side of that network was your own business, and that was a good thing, right? And so there is this synchrony that can happen between permission chains and public unpermission chains. A lot of people talk about fence posting uh, checksums into the public chains right. so that you have that extra layer of validation that the private chain is, is immutable, right? Or that you can go back in time and validate that that series of transactions was correct. So but there isn't a, a, a presumption that these are just you know, a temporary stepping stone to everything being on the public okay, chain. Okay, so then the, the Bitcoin blockchain or whatever, you know, the public blockchain of record whatever we want to call that at this point, um, that you can take the advantages and the privacy and the specificity of the system that you create on the private side, and then you can, like you said, um, a signpost or fence post, yeah, yeah basically uh, embed a fingerprint into the public record, which then makes your private record tamper evident. Is that right? It enhances the security, but it might already be tamper-proof tamper if you do other things to back up the data. Right. That's, that's yeah, distributed, right. distributed on a blockchain it's in a tamper-proof way. Good security comes in layers. Okay, okay. So, so the public blockchain, it sounds like, has a role to play in this kind of no matter what. And private blockchains are really more of like a supplemental layer that can go uh, either separately as an entire aside or can be used in conjunction with public blockchains. It can be. I stand by my assertion there'll be millions of private permission chains, you call uh -huh. it that. Some of them public, some of them private. But, but the problem is uh, so who needs that so certified data stored in the private blockchain? Because so company A uh, stores so many many data in the private blockchain inside of company A, and so the problem is who needs that uh, the, uh, the immutable or the, uh, certified data? Yeah. Certified means that uh, that data is not uh, ch uh, not changed, and so for example, so. Uh, some companies should uh, have an so audit, external audit from the third party. And uh, this kind of data is uh, useful f to uh, uh, certify that uh, the correctness of that company. Well, they'll be auditing as a service, yeah. where entities that perform the traditional auditing function will sit as a node on that network, whether big, public, and anonymous, or permissioned and private. Uh, and the regulators themselves are really actually eager to see blockchains adopted by the financial services industry, because being a node on that consensus network gives them visibility in real time to the closing of transactions, and al allows them to look for patterns that may lead to greater volatility or potential patterns of corruption, you know. And this is even putting aside the fact that the DOJ loves uh, Bitcoin because all the all the coins that are used in for illicit purposes are tra fully trackable, it got modulo mixers out there. Um, but uh, uh, has that has actually led to convictions and, and arrests. I think that the interoper interoperability between the private blockchain and the public blockchain uh, regarding that, that kind of use case is a discussion of that issue is needed here. Yeah. 
So, um, talking about standardization um, on a you know on the blockchain, one of the things that we were talking about here is kind of the intercompatibility between different blockchains. And right now, that's something that happens using server software that's entirely separate from the blockchains. I guess my question is kind of, uh, in a world where we're going to have many, many, many blockchains, don't they need to talk to each other? Don't they need to? I mean, like, so will that eventually find its way into the actual core consensus code, or is that something that is going to have to continue to be added in these layers above? So I, my take is this is, you know, there's a need for common software underneath these chains, right? And um, to the point where these million chains might only differ by runtime configuration changes, right? When you mine your Genesis block or when you decide what smart contract engine you want to use. But some, some communities will want, you know, much more constrained languages. Some of them will want full Turing complete, right? And it's kind of up to them to decide how they want to do that. Um, where there's value in standardization is in the conversations about what are the you know, services that you might build on top of a DLT, right? So it'd be nice to take Solidity, for example, and have that portable to a number of different DLT types, right? Distributed ledger technologies. It might be nice to take the way that identity is invoked and, and represented on one chain and be able to tie that identity to transactions on another chain, right? Um, but this is like the internet, you know? We, we build these technologies as layers. Some of them start as very ad hoc types of standards, right? Um, I think... My, my belief is, and I think others uh, uh, see it this way, that open, open ad hoc standards that are implemented by open source software end up getting more widely adopted and then implemented than something that starts out as a, as a, as a formal specification that you hope the in entire industry adopts but then implements diversely, right? And, and I think that's, that's, that's kind of the direction you'll see. I mean, these, that's why these chains started out as open source projects first rather than abstract yeah. definitions. So there are many, many sort of aspects of regarding to the standardization. For example, so Hyperledger so tried to just uh, make a, some kind of standard of code or software. Um, but uh, so the uh, current news is uh, so ISO IEC, so initiate a new technical committee for the blockchain technology. But uh, so the problem, the bad news is uh, so no uh, uh, specific scope of that uh, uh, standard is d defined. Uh, I think that uh, my opinion is that it's it too early to make uh, some kind of so, this, uh, such kind of de jure standard uh, for the blockchain technology. The problem is uh, so what kind of uh, technology or so what kind of matter should be standardized, standardized at ISO IC? Right. The other news is uh, so also W3C started the discussion about uh, so, uh, standardization regarding the blockchain. And so the main focus on the W3C is. Uh, uh, Technic, uh, technology regarding to the so web browser, but so the relationship that the web browser and the block, fundamental blockchain technology is unclear at this time. Yeah. So what? So, well, so uh, there is some aspect, some sort of, uh, 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 aspects uh, regarding to the so standardization. That so, uh, and so uh, I would like to hear the, from the from you about the so. What kind of perspective is uh, important uh, regarding to the blockchain standardization at this time? Well, I think I think because we're in a Cambrian explosion of, tech, of, of innovation, invention, when it comes to these underlying technologies, and there isn't yet clear consensus on the right uh, consensus mechanism or the right smart contract engine, I think we should look to where the open source communities are working on technologies. Um, and any, any company that is looking for a simple answer to what blockchain tech should I deploy, there's not very much of that right now. I think, uh, actually, you know, if you want to start playing, Ethereum has a bunch of great tools for being able to get started quickly on, on some simple smart contracts and, and learning about the physics of that space. But if you're a bank, you know, uh, you can uh, work with a number of different companies in this space, both startup companies like IntellectEU, which is out here in the audience, um, uh, and others, uh, to uh, uh, start investigating and exploring how the, those technologies should work. Uh, or a, a substantial company like IBM that has a lot of companies that are now trying to reinvent their, their information systems and outsource that. Or take a portfolio of 
approach and try to understand what are the, the strengths and weaknesses of the different technologies out there and play. I mean, this is how we learn as we play at this point. And it really is, you said 1995 in the web, I'd say 94 in the web. And we were busy standardizing HTTP and HTML, but what we really needed for, to allow the web to take off was the next level up. It was CSS, it was JavaScript, it was HTML5, you know, which, which came much later, uh, but it was these additional layers, and we're still, we're still pre-TLS at this point, pre-SSL, um, figuring out how to do, say, confidential uh, uh, transactions on a blockchain is still at the bleeding edge of computer science. So when is the appropriate time to standardize then? You know, if we're not talking, if we're saying it's inappropriate at this point because we just don't know, then I mean, like, it seems like at some point you have to make a decision. Do you wait to make the decision until the winner becomes obvious, or do you just, I mean, like, does, does it matter? Do we not need to pick? Um, I, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. But <laughs> I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, blockchain is still it's in infancy, so that uh, the, this uh, kind of chaos will continue next maybe three to five years or so. But uh, we, uh, instead of the waiting for, you know, some point that we are all happy to, you know, make the standard, I think we uh, should have some kind of a community to work together to, you know, discuss what should be the standard. And, and I think that's the kind of hyperledger project object. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience. I have one more question to ask. Um, specifically, um, so we don't know if proof of work is the right thing. But we do know that it's the thing that seems to have worked the best so far, at least on the public blockchains. Um, does that math carry through to private blockchains as well, or is the what, what's kind of the value proposition that you're looking for from the consensus mechanism when you're talking about specifically private applications? Yeah, so the in a financial institutions or financial infrastructure, the finality of the transaction is a very important thing, and uh, I don't personally think that the proof of work can assure the finality. Uh, so that we need a more a robust consensus mechanism that can assure the finality and also can achieve the higher performance. So staying on that thought, so okay, so the finality is important, but it doesn't necessarily matter how we get there. It just matters that it be there and that it have the greater throughput to be able to, to kind of power that. Is that right? Uh, so I, I'm not sure. The proof of work's finality is kind of like eventually final. So at some point, you have a con enough confidence that the nobody can prove it. Right, right. The proof of work so, is you burn a bunch of money and you say the next person that comes along or the person who's trying to steal my money isn't going to burn more money than I already did and that other people have done you know, subsequently since I did that thing. And so you're saying that in financial applications specifically, there is a scenario where somebody might burn a whole bunch of money, more money than you did that, and, may, and it's... It gets more secure as time goes on, but it's a it's a gradient, and you don't need a gradient. You need 100% yes exactly. all the time. Exactly. So the thing that you sacrifice for that in a private blockchain is the ability for everyone to participate. So then you have identified participants, but you don't care about that because you're all, all complying with the law anyways, so there's not really a downside to doing it in this fashion for you. Yeah, there's no downside for doing the PBFT like things in hmm. a private network. Interesting. Yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so if there are any questions, raise your hand and we can get to those. John Light, somebody bringing around a microphone? Yes, we have a microphone ready. Huh? Okay. Take a moment to introduce yourself, please. Great. I'm John Light, and I'm a contributor to Let's Talk Bitcoin and a longtime uh, Bitcoiner. Um, so I have a, a comment that maybe you guys can, can riff on a moment and, and a question. Uh, so first, my comment. Um, Brian, you mentioned that uh, it, it's not hard to use two blockchains at the same time, uh, at least in the context of permissionless blockchains. Uh, they have this feature where they get their security from kind of whichever blockchain has the most uh, proof of work uh, or hash power thrown at it is kind of the most secure blockchain. Uh, given that, um, you know, sure there, there there are a long tail of like smaller blockchains that can coexist, but they're much less secure than uh, maybe the fat head 
which might be like one or maybe two at most kind of blockchains that are actually meaningfully secure and can exist at scale with, with millions or billions of people using so, them. Uh, I'll say an yeah. example of an app that uses more than one public or unpermissioned chain is any exchange, right? A lot of you converting ETH to, to, to BTC, right? And, and you can imagine the same kind of exchange operating on uh, permission chains as well, right? Um, but your point is really about wouldn't you all want to use the same chain that has the most number of nodes, right? And the security that comes from that. And I mean, I, as, as previous presenters have talked about, security is just a, a multi uh, natured kind of question, right? Um, I, I, in the Bitcoin ecosystem, I don't know if this is true right now, but I know there have been points where something north of 70% of the hash power was controlled by a very small number, what, six mining pools, right? Uh, which ends up being far more concentrated, as Jeff Garzik pointed out, than the Federal Reserve System, which has 12 governors who all need to agree by unanimity anytime there's a change in the interest rate, right? So, uh, you know, arguably, uh, the question of, of sovereign and the question of who has control over a network is, is the classic Facebook, it's complicated kind of answer, right? Um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of points to that, but we have to kind of ask, what is, are we talking about security and the perspective of, you know, one in a millionth versus one in ten millionths of a chance of something going wrong or something that, I mean, we know how to tolerate risk and variability, um, uh, especially when your threat model is difficulty in forging consensus versus going back and rewriting the chain. I mean, that is a much deeper kind of problem thing you want to try to prevent. But in most cases, the failure of a consensus mechanism is uh, uh, one entity having an unfair advantage to write entries in the chain over another. It's not actually an erasing history, right? So uh, in that scenario, the, it, the fact that on many permission chains, you know who those participants are, and if somebody's DDoSing the system or performing something unfair, you have a corrective action you can take, is a very different threat model than assuming everyone's an enemy and, and you're on the, the wide open internet, right? So the physics are just very different when trying to compare these. Okay, okay, thank you for the commentary there. Um, and then my, my question was um, for more for the people who are working on um, per permission chains, perhaps, um, kind of related. Uh, how do you determine uh, which linked list, so to say, or, 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 or permission chain is authoritative if, if there's a fork in the system? Uh, as we just discussed, you know, public or permissionless chains deter are determined by the longest uh, valid proof of work blockchain. Uh, how do you determine uh, which, which fork is authoritative? So, so the theoretical fork doesn't help as long as you use a consensus mechanism like PBFT because uh, you need more than two thirds of the nodes to agree to you know, add a block. So uh, unlike uh, proof of work, it doesn't fork. If you have yeah. it, No, I just, you know. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a very loose comparison, but it's like comparing the Cassandra method of uh, database uh, operation to the MySQL acid compliant method. It's, you know, eventual consistency versus acid com conformance. And something like PBFT gives you more of a transactional view of what's, what's been confirmed. Like, you, that, it's locked in from that point forward. Uh, and uh, if, if, if parties disagree, right, if you end up with, I don't know, a, a neutri neutrino has come in and flipped a bit somewhere and somebody's checksum is different from everyone else's, well, that's, that's you know, you, you, you look at the network and go, well, you know, if that's one out of a thousand that failed or one out of ten that failed, then what's, you know, let's replay the clock and, and, and replay that consensus going forward. So I, I, I'm sure there's other deeper architectural answers to that question, but I, I, it, it, it's not been an operational problem on, on the networks that we see. Next question will be from our keynote speaker, Adam Back. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, I think the panel was largely talking about private chains. And so in my presentation at the beginning, I was talking about the uh, trust benefits of public chains. So I guess the question you could ask yourself is, you know, who's the beneficiary from this technology? Um, if, it's, if it's trying to improve trust you know, in the ecosystem, if it's a private chain, the, the users of the bank or the ecosystem can't see the trust. You know, Brian was talking about an auditor with a privileged view inside the network making an interview audit statement or something. So I just kind of put it to the panelists to distinguish private blockchains from the status quo in terms of the assurance they provide to the public. Did you understand the question? 
So, so the, what's that trust benefit in the private chain? Is that the question? Okay, so the, for example, in my use case, uh, I explained the, uh, there are several trusted authorities today. So for example, Central Securities Depository is a trusted authority who manages the, the, the depository or the master database of the securities ownership, right? So we have to trust them. But uh, by using the blockchain, we can distribute the trust to the multiple entities, including the participating banks. We don't have to trust, you know, only one or you know a few of the participants, but rather the uh, you know aggregation of the participants can build up a trust as a you know kind of consortium. So now I think uh, one of the parts of the question had to do with the benefits to the participants in the system who are not the banks. Was that right? So we're talking about the actual the people who buy you know who are using this system as the end users and the banks are enabling them to with this system but like uh, but 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 how does it benefit them is there any transparency benefit to the users of the system who are not the banks or not the actual you know corporate level participants oh that's a good question I I don't see much benefit except that uh, you know kind of the the, the value for the financial institutions can be cascaded to user so that user doesn't have to trust you know, any one of the trusted authority, but rather they can trust this uh, consortium that is made up of the major financial institutions, for example. Right, so, so I think the answer to that question is that there isn't a specific transparency benefit, but that there are trickle-down effects that come from, uh, that, that are beneficial, that come from that, because the banks don't have to trust each other either, which means that there, aren't the, there isn't the ability for one bank to act incorrectly, you know, know, in uh, out of compliance. You could still have the entire system be corrupted, I, I think, in a system like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, what you could say that banks already trust each other, and the 2008 financial collapse and Bitcoin's, you know, uh, Genesis block quote about, uh, you know, the governor of the Bank of England talking about bailouts and things is basically to say that the public has lost trust in banks, and here's some technology that means that you can get service from a bank without having to trust them, the kind of trust but verify phrase that we used at the Bitcoin scaling conference. And it seems that the application that you're proposing with a private blockchain is, you know, the benefit flows to the people inside the banking network and doesn't permeate, I mean, it's inside the firewall. The only message flowing outside the firewall is an end of year statement from an auditor or something. And that's, I mean, from a public perspective, that is the status quo. Well, I think that's more of an application layer question than a network level question. I think, so here's, here's a different example. Um, there's a company called Everledger that is working with the diamond industry to reinvent an existing process called the Kimberly process in the form of a blockchain, right? Kimberly process is a mechanism. Every time diamonds are handed off from one entity to another, uh, there's a piece of paper that's sent to an international org that keeps track of this provenance. Uh, and the main goal of that is to try to keep conflict diamonds from entering the supply chain, right? And the problem is all the problems you expect from a central trusted third party, especially one that's arguably unaccountable to anybody, right? Is a lack of visibility, a lack of automation, really, um, and no easy way to look up, I have this diamond, what mine did it come out of, and whose hands did it go through, right? So a company called Everledger and has been working with IBM and others to implement, with, with in conjunction with De Beers, who is still the 800-pound gorilla in the space, in conjunction with the retailers and the miners, um, who uh, not uh, Bitcoin miners, uh, the actual physical miners out of the ground, um, uh, to uh, uh, to implement this system, because not only does it meet these regulatory requirements of you know keeping um, diamonds from illicit mines from entering the system, uh, uh, but it also provides this operational advantage to retailers and even hopefully end consumers if you design it right to see where that provenance comes from. They've already been doing a pilot where they've been shadowing the actual system and in that shadowing they've, they've caught millions of dollars in fraud, uh, which they're not clear if it's fraud or simply uh, a lack of accounting standards yet, where uh, I, um, diamonds out from a given node were greater than diamonds in. <laughs> so uh, that's potentially a place where, where uh, uh, conflict diamonds were coming in. Uh, once it moves fully to the chain being the system of record, uh, then potentially things open up uh, uh, in terms of auditing that whole process, making it fair, hopefully keeping blood diamonds out of the circula uh, out of circulation, um, and hopefully getting to the point where individual diamond owners will be able to look up where their diamonds come from. But that, it shifts it from an application layer question from a network layer.
layer question. And I think your point is nothing about the network guarantees access to the individuals. I'd say that is true as well on a public chain. If I write nothing but encrypted data onto the public chain, uh, then that's an application layer decision I made to make that opaque to, to everyone else in the network. Okay, so it's a previous session. So we had uh, one question regarding to the definition of the trust. I think that at this time, it's, at this time, so we don't have the good definition of the trust for blockchain technology. But so uh, at this time, so one idea is defining that quality QoS of for the blockchain quality of service, including a quality, quality of trust. So each uh, blockchain, each specific blockchain has uh, some uh, kind, some grade of the. And so defining some languages to exchange the QoS data for each blockchain or data. Mm -hmm. this is, I think that this is a good uh, role of the uh, international standardization of the blockchain technology. Okay. Uh, this, can be, this can be sort of give us a uh, great understanding of that, so the trust of each data over the blockchain. Right, measures diversity yeah, of yeah. nodes and, and, and health, how much you could survive the departure of any one node, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Makes sense. We have time for one more question. Please raise your hand. Anything else that you guys want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I think that's it. Thank you, panel. Yeah. Thank you, panel.